Hello, everyone, and welcome to Matters Signature Tales from the Trenches series, uh, which we produce together with Village MD. Uh, so I'm Stephen Collins. I'm the CEO of Matter. We are a healthcare technology incubator and innovation hub on a mission to accelerate the pace of change of healthcare. We do three things in service of our mission. First, we incubate startups. Since we launched about seven years ago, we've worked with more than 700 companies. They range from very early to growth stage startups, and we have a suite of services to help them at every stage of development. Second, we work with large organizations such as health systems, life sciences companies, payers to strengthen their innovation capacity. We help them find value in emerging technologies, empower internal innovators to unlock the value of their ideas and create more human-centered healthcare experiences. And third, we are a nexus for people who are passionate about healthcare innovation. We bring people together to be inspired, to learn, to connect with each other. And we produce a lot of programs, including large scale events for the broader community, as well as small forums that are exclusively for our members. Tales from the Trenches is our longest standing series here at Matter, where accomplished entrepreneurs share their journeys from how they got started to what they've learned along the way. Uh, today, we will be joined by Dr. Imu, Iman Abuzid, who is the co-founder and CEO of Incredible Health. Uh, Dr. Abuzid has an MD and an MBA, and she did early career stints at some top-tier consulting firms and in product management before starting her first company in 2015. I started Incredible Health in 2017, and she also uh, has roles at two venture firms, NFX and Sequoia. Uh, Incredible Health is the fastest growing career marketplace for healthcare workers and is tackling what is arguably the number one challenge facing healthcare today, uh, staffing. Uh, the company is backed by Andreessen Horowitz, and their most recent round valued the company north of $1.6 billion. Uh, moderating the discussion today is Danielle, Sm Danielle Smith, the chief nursing officer of Village MD. Uh, when she joined the company, they had, I think, three clinics. They now have 300, and she oversees a team of more than 1,000 nurses and clinical support personnel. Uh, Village MD is an extraordinary company that is making value-based healthcare a reality, uh, now in partnership with Walgreens, which has committed more than $6 billion to scale Village MD around the country. Uh, Iman and Danielle, thank you so much for joining us today. We are uh, really looking forward to the conversation. All right. Well, Iman, um, I'm so excited to be here and, and having spent a little time learning about the company. First, before we start with the questions, I just have to say thank you for this innovative service for nurses. Um, it, it, it really, it's something that nurses need, but more importantly, our patients need it because we know patients have better outcomes and better care when we have adequate nursing staff. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so um, we'll dive right in. Um, as as uh, Stephen mentioned, hiring in healthcare has always been a challenge. Today, with the pandemic, burnout, travel nurse premiums, and high demand, uh, what possessed you to um, try to solve the issue of finding and hiring permanent nurses? Yeah, I think what uh, what motivated me is you have to dig into my backstory, honestly. So I'm an MD by background. Uh, I've been in technology for the last many years of my career, but a lot of my family members and friends are doctors and nurses. Um, and uh, the doctors in particular were always complaining about understaffing <laughs> and uh, how their OORs were always understaffed. At the same time, my co-founder, Ron Portlock, he's a uh, software engineer from MIT. He has many family members that are nurses. And they were saying, hey, I'm experienced, I'm qualified, and I apply to 10 places, and I just don't even hear back. And we, we figured there has to be a better way. You know, we know that healthcare is the biggest labor sector in the, country, in the country by number of workers. We know that it's also the sector that has the biggest labor shortages because our demand for healthcare keeps increasing as our population ages. Uh, but the demand, the supply of workers has not kept up with that demand. And we just figured there has to be a better way. Um, and it is. Because it is so easy. I did <laughs> I did the application almost to the end, and it was like it took me less than five minutes, which is amazing. So it's really you've simplified. It is a much better way. Um, 
So you mentioned that you grew up with a family. Did if I have that you have three immediate family members who are, are they physicians? Yeah, that's right. My uh, father and my two older brothers. All right. So how did this shape your interest in medicine? And do you think that this places a higher expectation on you to be successful in healthcare? Um, so, I mean, healthcare is probably the common theme throughout my entire career. So after uh, be, uh, finishing medical school, decided not to do residency, actually, uh, and then went into uh, hospital operations and hospital strategy work with uh, a couple of management consulting firms, McKinsey and Booz Allen, then did my MBA with a big focus on entrepreneurship and healthcare, and then uh, then moved out to the Bay Area, Bay Area to really get into startups and um, my first role at a startup was as a product manager, and that's really where I learned to work uh, with software engineers and designers and data scientists and what it takes to you know, create software products in healthcare and launch them to be successful. Um, so yeah, so I mean, fast forward, we've, we're building this, this company and this solution, and it's the first of its kind, you know, tech-enabled career marketplace for healthcare professionals. And uh, nurses and healthcare workers, they get their permanent roles through this, through this platform. And, and we are, we're also supporting them throughout their entire career. Fantastic. Um, did you, how did you overcome or did you place high expectations on yourself um, oh, yeah. that have shaped your ability? And then, and then how has that helped you steer the ship at Incredible Health? Yeah, so as far as just my family background, I mean, it's probably what drives a lot of the expectations and the ambition. Um, uh, I, I come from a family of immigrants, you know, we uh, immigrated to the US. I moved here when I was 24 years old, actually. Um, and so, uh, like many immigrant families, you know, there's just like a real huge emphasis on education, huge emphasis on driving excellence. Uh, and whatever you choose to do, you just need to make sure you really excel at it. And so that was really, you know, drilled into my mind, frankly, <laughs> from a very early age. Um, and uh, the, the other thing is both my both my grandfathers were entrepreneurs as well. So there's some of that, uh, some of those elements in my family already. So it, that has just made me someone who's um, ambitious, but also someone who's just very open to taking on risk, if that makes sense. So um, having a career with, with a stable role the entire time is you know, I think that's risky compared to like starting a company and, and being an entrepreneur. And I, I have this opinion that I think entrepreneurship is one of the best things you can do with a career in business, because uh, it means you can have a profound impact at scale, and you can transform entire industries. I love that optimism. <laughs> I am so risk averse. That's just not my, uh, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, Speaking of other other ventures, your first company, Lift League, mm -hmm. uh, is a platform for mobile and web applications that makes it easy for wellness, I guess, wellness coaches or professionals to improve client results and build better relationships with those clients. Um, what was the genesis for that? How did you how did you come up with that one? Yeah, I mean, the the truth is like that business did not work. And I'm happy to, you know, speak openly about failure. I mean, that that uh, that idea, that concept uh, of helping small and medium healthcare businesses retain their clients um, ultimately didn't work. Um, and uh, we worked on it for almost a year. Uh, and it was, the product was live. There was some revenue coming in, but we just could not get it to grow. And one of my biggest lessons learned from that entire experience is just how important ideation is. And how, as a founder, it's so important to spend and um, invest a time uh, and effort into just making sure and confirming that your idea is the right idea before you actually start executing it. Um, to cons honestly, looking at it like more like an investor, like is this is the market size big enough to sustain this idea? Do I really understand the problems that the users are having in this in this uh, market? Um, and what is my unique insight? Like what, what have we come up with that's at least 10X better than what's already out there? Um, and so I don't think we did that robust exercise uh, when we were starting Lift League and which is, which is probably the reason why it didn't work out. Did you do that with Ideal Health? It was with Incredible Health, yeah, yeah we did. Health. We did, yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. So it was a, a great learning experience then. So mm -hmm. There was not a whole lot of time lost. So Incredible Health closed at an $80 million Series B funding round and announced hitting a 1.65 billion unicorn valuation last week. 
Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Like, it's incredible. Um, so that makes you the highest valued tech enabled career marketplace in the healthcare sector. So can you expand on how you led Incredible Health through the funding process? Sure. Um, this is the, the third time I raised capital. So I had a, a seed round, a series A, now, now a series B. Um, uh, raising capital is definitely a, a whole process in and of itself. Uh, and for this one in particular, this is a growth round, right? So this is um, the, the round of design to help us continue to scale and invest heavily in R&D. And so Base 10 Partners led the, led the round as part of their ad advancement initiative, which is a fund that's designed to align like the success of technology companies with wealth creation for underrepresented minorities. And uh, they've, you know, th this is a growth uh, stage fund, right? So they've supported companies like uh, Devoted Health, Notion, Figma, and 50% of their carried interest actually goes to historically black colleges and universities uh, here in the US. And so we also have plans to set up scholarship initiatives for, for nurses, Incredible Health and Base 10 has, does. And so really when it comes to fundraising, a lot, of, a lot of it hinges on the story and who are the investors you're targeting. So as far as the story goes, you know, our vision is to help healthcare professionals live better lives. And the mission is to help them find and do their best work. Like that's the overarching goal of this company. And you know, we're defining this new category and becoming market leaders in healthcare labor. So communicating that story as well as you know everything that backs that up, like where the, the health systems that are using you, how many nurses, what what are the growth rates, and so on. What kind of services are you are you providing for free? Um, how are you using technology? All that is part of the story. Um, and then the, the the second part of fundraising is the process and who you target. And so I generally have a preference for Bay Area based investors, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, and they tend to be San Francisco based investors tend to be a lot more risk taking, actually, and, uh, and, and a lot more ambitious. Um, and they really do. The founders are very ambitious, but they we have to be partnered with investors that are that have the patience and are willing to do this and to support over the long term to build like a legendary company. Right. Um, and that's how, and we were fortunate to always be very selective about which investors that we go with. So each round of financing we've done, we've been able, been able to get multiple term sheets. So we're able to be very picky about who we go with. And we wanna make sure we choose investors that are frankly have missions that are aligned with ours. Um, and you know they reference very well, like they're good people, good humans, <laughs> honest, uh, high integrity, you know, see other CEOs, even CEOs of companies that did not work speak highly of them. And then finally, that they provide some kind of value um, in terms of, you know, they were former operators, they were former CEOs, they are marketplace experts, uh, and so on. Prior to Base 10, uh, we, we'd raised capital from uh, Jeff Jordan and Andreessen Horowitz and James Joaquin at Obvious Ventures. So you, so you did purposefully seek out partners like Base 10 as a way to pay it forward. Exactly, exactly. I, you know, I mentioned earlier, I'm a, um, I moved to this country when I was 24 years old. I think the uh, entire system in the US is just amazing. I mean, the fact that we can um, innovate, create products, solve user problems, in our case for nurse, for, you know, for nurses, and then in the future for other healthcare workers too, and for employers like, ho like hospitals and health systems, and have those returns be fed back into society is, is amazing. Um, two of the other investors that we have are um, Kaiser Permanente and Johns Hopkins. And, you know, in the case of Kaiser Permanente, it's the first time we have a customer invest in us as well. Yes. And um, the returns there go to the community programs that Kaiser run, runs, you know, their, their, their mental health programs, their pension plans. Uh, and so it's great to, you know, be able to give back to society as well. That's such a neat relationship too. As a customer, you're helping them save money uh, and retain nurses and get nurses and they're, and they're able to invest in your company as well, which is tremendous. I love this part. CNOs have described incredible help as the match.com of nursing and hospital placement. Um, and along those lines, nurses hired via incredible help have a 15% higher retention rate, uh, which is a tremendous statistic. Um, and it kind of shows that the match is working. Uh, but what, what do you attribute this significantly higher retention rate to? Yeah, the, it, I think I, I attribute it to the fact that the nurses were able to go through a very thorough job search before selecting an employer. 
what I mean by that is like there's three key aspects to incredible health that really differentiate it and are driving the value here. The first is that the employers are applying to the nurses instead of the other way around. Right. Uh, as you can imagine, the nurses absolutely love that, right? Because they create a profile, they sit back and relax. <laughs> they get interview requests from different employers. They the nurse gets to choose which interviews to accept and which ones to decline. The second piece is that we've automated the screening of the talents. We built robust like uh, screening technology that that operates at scale to so we can very rapidly verify credentials and skills and uh, certifications and malpractice records and so on. Um, and and and. Uh, and then the third piece is the custom matching technology. So for every em employer and nurse we're working with, they, they are benefiting from our custom matching technology that's increasingly getting better. What I mean by that is, let's say you're a nurse recruiter at, I don't know, NYU Langone, right? And you log in, like you don't really want to see 276 nurses. Like you need to see 14 that are the right fit for your roles at the time that match and where their preferences match yours. And it's the same thing for a nurse. Like, let's say you are a highly sought after ICU nurse and OR nurse, ED yeah. nurse, like these are very high, highly sought after people, right? So uh, they don't wanna hear from hundred employers. They need to hear from four or five that are the fit for what they're looking for and their preferences and their, and their backgrounds. Uh, and so that's what the matching algorithms do. The end result of all of this is, 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 is a few benefits to the users. Like first, um, for nurses, you mentioned, you know, 15% on average increase in salary. And we, by the way, we only do permanent work. We, there's no temporary workers on our platform. Um, we, we see see a reduction in commute time, 17% average reduction in commute time. Uh, and then one third of the hires on our platform are actually relocating from different states. So this is definitely a platform that helps nurses that are looking to relocate uh, to other locations. Um, and then on the hospital side, you know, it has to be a win for them too. So we're accelerating hiring for them from, you know, the 82 day, 82 day national average to, you know, less than 14 days, but we're also driving cost savings for them. So at least $2 million saved per hospital location. Uh, and that's in travel nurse costs, overtime costs, HR costs that they don't have to spend because they were able to uh, accelerate the hiring of permanent nurses. Fantastic. <laughs> it's just seems uh, incredible. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And uh, it's funny, depending on the generation of CNO, we get called the match.com of hospitals and nurses or the Bumble or the, the Bumble Hinge. And Tinder. It just depends on, the, <laughs> depends on the generation of the CNO. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what does the future of incredible health look like? I heard you mention, you know, possibly expanding to other healthcare, but what are some other? Yeah. Uh, so you know, we're, we're on this like march to define this category and be the market leaders in healthcare labor. And so what we're doing with this capital that we just raised is, is, is three or four different things. First, we want to continue investing in optimizing and automating every part of the hiring workflow. So that includes the screening and the matching. And we want to just keep on making it more personalized and more automated for both the nurses and for the, and for the hospitals. Um, the second is we want to continue investing in the career tools and services that we have for nurses. So we already have free continuing education for every single nurse in the country, country accredited in all 50 states built into our apps. We have free salary estimators in our apps. We have uh, a community where nurses can ask each other for advice, like career advice and, and advice on other topics, honestly, as well. Um, and so we want to continue investing in that, including areas of skill growth, educational scholarships, cross training opportunities and so on to keep to ensure that this is the place where nurses are managing their career. This is not only the place where they're uh, finding a permanent role. Um, and then the third area is we want to, I mentioned the advice platform, the community that we've built. We want to continue investing in that because that's, uh, it, it looks like nurses are driving an enormous amount of value from that. And we are now the biggest online community of nurses. Um, and then finally, we want to expand, you know, so we're continuing our geographic expansion. We're live in 25 states. We'll continue adding more states. But we want to add more roles beyond nursing uh, and then more types of employers beyond hospitals. You know, healthcare is, you know, is huge, right? And so yeah. even beyond nurses, there's doctors and physical therapists and pharmacists and so on that can benefit from something like this. And even beyond hospitals, you know, there's sur surgical centers and urgent care and so on. So of course, we want to take it all, but like has to be very systematic with our growth. Sure. I think villages recruiters would be really happy with those, uh, the, the shortening <laughs> time to, uh, to getting staff in. Um, what was the biggest entrep entrepreneurial mistake you've made and how do you make sure you don't make it again? Oh, uh, the biggest, the, the number one is what I mentioned earlier around just what happened with Lips League and, and the ideation or lack of ideation. Um, <laughs> 
So what we ended up doing after that um, is going through a very robust and detailed ideation process, right? So um, we came up with, my co-founder and I, at the, th at the time, it was, just, it was just the two of us, right? Uh, we came up with probably a hundred different ideas. We evaluated each of them based on market size, based on competition, based on unique insight. Like unique insights, what have we come up with that's at least 10 times better than what's already out there? Better defined as cheaper, faster, you know? more more delightful whatever however you want to define it um and honestly for a lot of the ideas we had like we couldn't even come up with a unique insight like it's hard like um yeah. and ultimately like narrowed it down to the, we had about 10 ideas um a lot of them actually were in healthcare a lot of the ideas are in healthcare just given my background and as well as um Rome, my co-founder's background too and and then after that we just went deep on market research customer research and um realize you know the way the way we interact with the, the way to do customer research is to present things as a concept not as a product or a company right be like hey so i'm thinking about this idea um just so it's non-committal and so that way they're 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 much more honest with you uh, right. about what they think not that you're um, interested at that point <laughs> exactly so yeah that that by far is probably my number one that mistake so. yeah um if you could tell 20 year old Iman something, what would it be? Uh, probably just like you got this, you know, that's pretty much it. Like, I think, I think a lot of us go through our teenage years, 20, so on, just like uh, with self doubt. <laughs> and it's probably, um, it's probably a little bit, for me, me at least, it was pretty, it was probably more than it should have been like just the whole really ensuring that I quiet like the self-critic voice you know in my mind and just going for it and just being being a little more confident is probably what I would tell my 20 year old self well it worked it turned out at some point where you became not, <laughs> yeah not afraid just really yeah, absolutely 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 I mean look I, I think that uh like related to this topic is sort of mental health or I mean, we can talk about mental health for nurses. We can talk about mental health for entrepreneurs. Um, but I'm just a big fan of just ensuring that if you're an entrepreneur who's building a company, so it's a generally a very, it's a difficult journey psychologically. And your number one job is to manage your own psychology. And so I'm a big fan of therapy, of having an executive coach, of having a CEO support group. And, you know, all, all of that has been extremely helpful to me in, in this journey. Good for you. You know, you, you mentioned... I didn't realize Incredible Health started in 2017. Is that right? I, I can't even imagine what the pandemic, I mean, you it was a great idea pre-pandemic. It became a, an astronomically incredible idea at, at once the pandemic started. Um, but I would imagine that really changed things for you. What would you say would be the biggest change that it did for Incredible Health. Yeah, uh, the pandemic definitely impacted our business in, in a lot of ways, and certainly it was impact heavily impacting our users, both sides, you know, both hospitals and, and the nurses. Um, it uh, what it did for us is it uh, it changed parts of our product roadmap, you know, changed what we were building. So we had to really invest heavily in. Um, in the nurse community that we had built, in, in the mental health features and tools that we were offering. Um, we had to uh, really, uh, put, we had to put together our pandemic hiring suite, which is like a whole nother set of features that helps hospitals hire even more rapidly because it was such a burning issue to hire uh, more permanent nurses faster. Um, so it definitely influenced our product roadmap. And then it just really built up our um, like empathy for the for for our users. Uh, I I still remember to this day like uh, zooms with uh, a C CNOs and 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 HR leaders. And during the Zoom, they they were like, "I'm I'm sorry, I need to interrupt because uh, I just found out one of our employees just passed away right from COVID. Right, this is pre vaccine and so on. So they, they, this was like a very uh, visceral uh, problem and issue that was affecting both sides of our marketplace and. There were the, the, the probably the third way it influenced us is just like in terms of just the press attention we got and the reports that we were putting out. We, we put a big annual you know data report on the state of nursing in the U.S. every single year. Um, we were probably one of the first reports in 2021 to sh to share that there's going to be a lot of vaccine hesitancy among nurses. Um, 
at that time, just surveying nurse, surveying our nurse database, we have over 400,000 nurses in our, on our database. So ten, around 10% 10 of US nurses use us. Um, we had discovered that 25% were considering not taking the vaccine, right? And that, that was like very surprising. And then vaccines rolled out and then like, it was actually true. Um, and then after, and then this year's report, one of the uh, insights that we had or that we discovered is that one third of nurses are considering leaving the profession permanently by the end of this year. Um, and so just like the sort of the decimation that happened in this nursing workforce, because as a result of the pandemic was very real and, and that was definitely showing up in the data reports that we were publishing. That's incredible. If you have 10% of the U.S. workforce, nursing workforce already, and you're only in 25 states. So that's, uh, I expect it to grow quite a bit. Yeah, there's still, we still have a long way. We still have some ways to go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's incredible. Um, sorry, I keep saying incredible, but it's a fitting <laughs> name. <laughs> what advice do you have uh, for entrepreneurs listening in who are just starting out? Uh, yeah, I have a, a, a few different tips. Um, one I shared earlier is just make sure your idea is foolproof before you even start executing, because it's, it's like a ship leaving a harbor, right? You want to make sure your ship is pointed in the right direction so you don't end up somewhere random. Um, uh, second is uh, just the importance of user obsession, user obsession. We call it customer obsession here at Incredible Health. Do whatever you can to delight your users. Um, and at the end of the day, they are your, they are your most, most important constituent uh, when you're building a company. It's not, you know, I'd love to say it's the investors or, or the employees or the co-founder or so on. No, it's actually your, your customers, your, your users will make or break you. Um, and if you are uh, delivering on their needs and delighting them, then that usually ends up satisfying the rest of the parties that you're involved with. Um, yeah, those are probably my top, my top two. Sounds nice. Uh, the only other thing I have, I think, is what do you do every day that contributes to your success? Um, I'll, I'll chat more, a little more about non-work stuff, because I think a lot of that contributes to the success. So first, it's just like the importance of just having boundaries, because work is, um, when you're building a high growth company, the work is really all consuming. The to-do lists are never ending. And it's not just me, it's even, even my team members, right? Um, and with growth rates this high, I mean, so for example, like in 2021, our top line revenue grew 500%, right? And that's just a lot of growth uh, and a lot to keep up with. And so uh, just ensuring that you have boundaries in place. In my case, um, I won't work on Saturdays, for example, no matter what's happening. <laughs> um, I try to have dinner with my husband like three times, three times a week. I can't do it all five nights a week, to be, to be honest, but three times is good. Um, I have team members that also, you know, that what enables their success is they just have, uh, you know, dedicated time to spend with their kids, for example. Um, I mentioned earlier another non-work set of items that have contributed to my success is the um, the executive coach, the, the therapy, the, you know, having a therapist on hand and also just being part of a really strong um, support group with other founders and CEOs. It's literally a WhatsApp group and, you know, sometimes we meet up in person too, but there's very, many variations of this. There's YPO and there's many other type of forms of support groups, which I think is very helpful because really the only, the only other uh, individuals who are really going to empathize and understand what you're going through is other founders and other CEOs. Yeah. Would you, when you say you don't work on Saturdays, do you really turn it completely off? Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. Good for you. That's, and, and speaking of the rapid growth, um, and you talked about it, one of the, the big challenges I know we face it here at Village and and entrepreneurs face if they are fortunate enough to lead a company that scales this rapidly um, is dealing with the internal mechanics of scale, the leadership team that goes from no revenue to 10 million to now where you are, um, you know, may not be the same team that takes the business all the way. Um, and then, you know, you have a culture that energizes a small upstart, but then maybe not where it is now. So how have you navigated these issues in your business? And yeah, uh, these are great, great topics. Um, great question. So uh, there's a few ways that we've navigated scaling. Um, 
first and foremost, it really starts with the mission, vision, and values. You know, so the vision is to help healthcare professionals live their lives. The mission is to help them find and do their best work. And then we also have a set of values that are really like the operating system of the company and they're how we work together. We actually crafted these values when we started in 2017, just me, it was just me and Rome at the time. Yeah. Um, and you know, things like yeah. values like customer obsession, do whatever you can to delight users, speed, move as quickly as humanly possible. It's one of the main competitive advantages you have as a high growth startup is you can move faster than anyone else in the market. Um, disagree and commit, make sure you have an environment that's safe where we can disagree and debate and dissent and we're making decisions based on uh, what's best for the business and what's best for the users, not what's best for someone's ego or someone's title or <laughs> and other things that get introduced uh, as you're scaling. Um, uh -huh. And so really the values are implemented uh, as part of our hiring processes. So they're evaluated when we're hiring. We have certain interview questions that are crafted around many of our values. Um, they're part of employee onboarding and they're also part of performance reviews. So how well did this person live up to incredible health like set of values? Um, so that, that's that been this like almost like creating that framework. I mean, people call it culture. I don't, I, I, culture is a very, um, non-tangible thing <laughs> so that's why I like to put like some definition around it but effectively that is the incredible health that is shaping and defining incredible health culture and it has to, yep, it's a very proactive exercise um secondly you mentioned you know the, the 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 leadership changes and the constant upgrading that has to happen yeah. um when you're scaling this rapidly I'd say there's probably three areas that has to constantly get better uh, one is leadership, two is um, processes and tools and infrastructure, right? Um, and then three is just like we have to keep upgrade, keep enhancing and maintaining the culture. So um, on the leaders, like, yeah, I've had to spend the last 18 months like building out a full-blown senior executive team. I've got a very senior leader in sales and customer success and in, 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 in HR and in, in, in so on, right? Um, in product and in engineering. And so, so really it's just... Um, I have a requirement for hiring senior executives that you have to have come from another high growth setting yeah. um, because this is a it's completely hard different kind of arms, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right. It's hard to describe you're until you're in it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because their, their jobs are challenging. Imagine needing to hire, train, build out process, hit metrics, uh, you know, collaborate with your peers, et cetera, all at the same time uh, while the company's growing at 500%. You know, like it's just, it's this very, uh, these are very challenging roles. Yeah. Sure. I think there are any questions in the chat. Let's see. I think there's a few that came through. Uh, how do you navigate and lead your teams who are burned out and regularly say in response to any task, we are just so short staffed. How do you keep your staff motivated and engaged? Yeah, this is a great question. I, I'm interpreting that question as, as what the, not so much what, what is incredible, what is uh, happening inside Incredible Health, but how are um, hospital executives, for example, tackling this problem with their nursing staff? Um, yeah. um, you know, we, we uh, have, uh, robust data reports. Our most recent one was like a third annual nursing report, like um, which, which published earlier this year. And we check, we, we, when, when profiles are being created on our platform, when nurses are joining Incredible Health, we are checking what are the reasons for why they're changing jobs. And by far, the number one reason is career advancement. I am looking to advance my career. I want to grow my skills or I want to get, that comes in many forms, growing my skills, getting more specialized, moving into leadership, cross-training, you know, uh, et cetera. It comes in many, many flavors. By far, that's the number one reason why nurses are leaving uh, or changing changing jobs. Number two, uh, most common is uh, I'm looking for a better schedule. Um, and num number three is uh, something to do with geography. I'm looking to reduce my commute time or I want to relocate. And then number four is actually compensation. Um, and so we, what we're finding is that the nursing leaders and HR leaders that have crafted uh, their strategies and tactics around those areas, especially the first two, career advancement and flexible scheduling, tend to have better retention and tend to be able to hire more. Um, so investing heavily in career advancement programs has pays off huge dividends in retention and hiring. Um, investing in uh, um, providing more flexibility in scheduling whether it's self-scheduling, um, not just being restricted to the, you know, three, three days a week, 12 hour shift, offering more weekend options, um, 
and so on has it has ensured that that it helps ensure that nurses can fit their roles and their jobs into the rest of their lives. Uh, also improves retention and hiring. So that, those are some of the, the I guess, the, the tactics that we have. And we do lots of events and webinars with CNOs and CHROs, actually, um, and uh, where they're they're sharing their tactics and their ideas for how they drive retention and motivate their staff and um, and, and and drive more hiring too. It's great to be able to learn from it and with the data that you have to share it with them. Um, how do you support nurses with low or no tech, yeah. I guess, capabilities? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. So, I mean, our, our thesis is that nurses are interacting and supporting each other in the offline world, okay? That's already, that's that's happening. And so the the, the role of the technology is like, how, do, how can we um, accelerate that and pour fuel on that and scale it, right? And so, for example, our, our nurse community inside our inside the incredible health apps um, uh, is is a way to you know take advantage is, is a way to um, take that all that offline activity and bring it into a more into a safe forum that's at, at scale where you know the ER nurse in New York City <laughs> is able to help the uh, ER nurse in El Paso Texas right um, there's very specific questions being asked in this community. And the unique thing, because of our access to data and the nurse profiles and so on, so, so let's say let's say an ED nurse is asking, um, you know, I'm trying to grow my skills in the ED in X Y Z ways. We are able to automatically ping the ED nurses in our database that hey, this question's here. Are you would you be open to answering it? And they're able to come in and answer that question in a very specific way. Um, and so, the the role of technology is to really like um, shape and craft. Uh, these these conversations, and we can take advantage of things like you know being a, a, able to ping all the ER nurses in our database right. to answer a specific question. Nurses helping nursing with the support of, of tech. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you target international markets, or are you focus? Is your focus exclusively in the U.S. market? Um, right now, it's exclusively the U.S. I mean, the U.S. healthcare market is massive, so it's really really keeping us very busy. <laughs> we have no plans to go um, to go international. Um, one other, sorry, quick comment. I just wanted to comment around supporting nurses with, with, with no tech. I, 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 one of our theses and what we've discovered is technology is important, but the human layer matters just as much. And so we really invested in adding uh, what we call our talent advocate team. And so this is a team of nurses employed by Incredible Health. And you can think of them as career coaches. And so they're helping nurses with interview preparation, um, helping them evaluate offers, and when you see the reviews of Incredible Health on Google, on Facebook, and even in the Apple App Store, I mean, yeah. they uh, a lot of the reviews comment are, are about their talent advocate. And yeah, so exactly. I, I I don't I I'm not I'm not at all ever want to say that tech is like the panacea. It's like the solution to everything. It's really not. <laughs> it's, it's it's one aspect of it, but the human component that we've layered on top of this is 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 critical. Has been critical to our success as well. That's what I, I read so many five-star reviews and so many of the times it was all about their talent advocate. Yeah, they name them, them by name, right? Yeah. Yes, they know them <laughs> by name and, and are really um, grateful for their help. I love this. What made you overcome the Stockholm syndrome, being a physician, ignore a stable paycheck and take a risky route that, that adversity did you, what adversity did you face? What's your advice? I am an also an MD and an MBA and would love to hear your story. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's a great question. I get that question very often, actually. Um, <laughs> one thing I just wanted to say is like, just, you know, working as a clinician, whether you're an MD or a nurse, I mean, it is a great career. Okay. So like it is um, the ability to have an impact one-on-one -on, -one on patient care um, and do all the thing, great things that MDs and RNs do, like whether it's research or, you know, so on. It's just like delivering on patient care, frankly, is, is, is a, uh, it's a phenomenal career, and I really hope that more, you know, more Americans opt into those jobs, right? We, need, we definitely need more nurses and more MDs and so on. Um, as far as like just the entrepreneurship aspect of it specifically, um, I guess the way I evaluate risk is different than many of my MD peers, right? So I I, I think uh, having what 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 is described described as a stable paycheck and a quote-unquote less risky route is actually quite risky. Yeah. 
it means that the, the impact that you might have and the scale that you're able to achieve is going to be, could be somewhat limited. Um, and at least that's how I, I perceived it for myself, right? Uh, and so uh, I think going down the entrepreneurship path is, in my opinion, less risky uh, because it means that you're able to uh, pursue uh, a huge vision, huge, huge ambitions. You're able to transform entire industries. You're able to operate at scale. Um, now, having said that, I mean, obviously, it's like the, the path is difficult and wrought with failure and, and so on. But um, I guess I, I just didn't see any other path for me. What was your best strategy for finding investors? Oh, uh, great question. So um, finding investors and just the whole fu fundraising, a very many aspects of the fundraising process is like sales, right? It's just, just like finding you know, possible executives and health systems and, or just like uh, encouraging team members to join your team. I mean, so much of what you do as a CEO is selling, right? To different, different constituents and different parties and investors are no different. Uh, in my case specifically, I think my move to the San Francisco Bay Area back in 2013 was critical. Um, it, that is how um, I eventually got um, it, it integrated into the, um, the Silicon Valley or San Francisco Bay Area investing community. Um, it actually started with a Wharton professor of mine, his name is Adam Grant. And Adam introduced me to one team member, I think one investor, uh, and then that investor introduced me to three or four more. Like it's, a, it's just a giant networking exercise, uh, to be honest, in, in order to um, build out that network. Now, there are also specific tools that help you identify investors too. So for example, signal.nfx.com, um, crunchbase.com, like these, these are, they have entire databases of investors. The cool thing about Signal, signal.nfx.com, is that you can literally filter it by geography, by investor interest, by check size. And so you can, re or you can really just um, customize that search to specifically what you're looking for. And then it'll pop up like this great list. And then after that, it's like a networking exercise of how to get to them. Get you narrowed in. Um, do you work with employers to actually improve what they are offering nurses as far as schedules, benefit, pay, et cetera? Kind of we, touch we do. I mean, this was one of the surprises that I, that I had, um, you know, it, in our early days, I was like, okay, just as long as we deliver on the, as long as we have enough, we have the, enough and the right nurses in front of them, everything will be fine. Turns out that it's actually a little more complicated than that. <laughs> and we have a, an entire customer success team here at Incredible Health that manages the relationships with employers. And one of the key things they do is share best practices on hiring, on retention, on benefits, perks, um, all, you know, and, and so on. Because we have the benefit of working with so many different hospital teams. We work with over 600 hospitals and health systems across the country. We work with very big ones like Kaiser Permanente and HCA Healthcare. We work with academic medical centers like Cedar sinai and Stanford and Johns Hopkins and NYU. and um, and lots of community hospitals too. And so we're in a unique position to really share practices. Um, and uh, it turns out that by, by accelerating your internal hiring operations, for example, or by offering more flexible scheduling and so on, you're able to hire more. And so these, a lot of this is, is shared with teams. Obviously, like the health systems are competing, so it's shared in a way that's very anonymous. Right. But um, uh, we, we have had to, we have had to, whether we like it or not, play a big role in that as well. Interesting outcome. Thanks for your insights, Iman. How do you find your co-founder support group? How did you find your co-founder support group? And how do you look for your mentors, personal board of advisors as an entrepreneur? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I, I think it was, for me, it was very much a gradual process. It just built up over time. So for example, um, the, the group of founders that I interact with, I met, met a few of them when I initially moved to the San Francisco Bay Area and then over the course of 10 years have just like really built up that network. Um, and to the point where now we meet, we meet socially, we're friends, we've gone to each other's weddings, et cetera, right? Uh -huh. just, uh, just like, it's just another, it's another group of work colleagues, uh, essentially. Um, and uh, for, the, for the personal board of advisors, I love that phrasing. Um, that has also happened gradually. I think our, one of my first um, 
groups of advisors were my early investors. So uh, James Courier at NFX, James Joaquin at Lobbyist Ventures, Charles Hudson at Precursor Ventures. I mean, these were some of our first believers, first backers, and all of them have extensive operating experience too. Uh, and so at the end of the day, um, sure, the capital is great, but like the fact that they had added value in other ways, including giving me fantastic mm -hmm. advice, has has been has been very helpful. I think probably now at this point, one of my one of my biggest advisors is Jeff Jordan and Andreessen Horowitz. You know, Jeff Jordan was a CEO of OpenTable, right? He was president at eBay. Um, he was an early investor and board member at Airbnb and Instacart and um, and uh, Pinterest. And so he he knows marketplace. He knows two sided marketplaces. Like he knows it cold, right? He's been doing this stuff since the late '90s. And so just his advice, he is our board member as well, has been uh, critical uh, for me as well and for for my ability to develop as a CEO too. As a female entrepreneur and a successful businesswoman, what are the ways that you could support other females moving in the same path coming from your background origin? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, you know, we're all, I'm, I'm very aware, and I think, you know, probably a lot of people on this call are aware of some of the biases and issues that happen with female CEOs as well as minority CEOs, uh, just the, around our access to capital and so on. Um, and look, look, that that structural bias is real. I mean, the, the, the numbers speak for themselves. Um, what I often um, say to myself, as well as others that you know look like me, is it, it's good to be aware of that, but you just actually can't even think about that when you're trying to, trying to pursue your vision and your mission. Um, it's it's almost like you have to suppress or compartmentalize uh, all of that and just uh, be extremely assertive about your ambitions and your mission and what you're trying to do. Um, and that that is, you know, back to what I was saying earlier, where like, you know, you, you have to, you, you're speaking to the press, you're speaking to team members, you're joining your team, you're speaking to customers, you're et cetera. So like it, it is it is uh, just very important that you really just be assertive and just go for it. Um, at the end of the day, it's going to be us that change the paradigm, right? Change, change how this all works. Like it would, it'll be our successes that change the numbers. Yeah. It says when you, um, when you first launched Incredible Health, how did you generate demand and obtain buy-in from hospitals? Oh, uh, okay, great question. You're bring, you're bringing back some memories. Okay, so, <laughs> uh, getting as as many many of you are aware, like, um. Getting a large enterprise like a hospital or health system to um, give your startup a try or give your product a try is, is, is tough, right? Um, and to get them to listen to you. <laughs> yeah. Our, our, what I call early, our early adopters were in the San Francisco Bay Area. So uh, HCA Healthcare, Stanford, uh, Stanford, Stanford Children's, um, uh, so on. They, they, these were some of our earliest teams joining our platform. When I think back around how we got the early team, so first of all, it uh, it's the early team that does it, right? So it's either at the time it was me or one, you know, one other team member. That's we just have to really grind it out to to get those initial team members, uh, initial hospitals, excuse me. And uh, what's very important, so there's two issues. One was there's two things you have to tackle. One is access, and then the second is what are you? What's your messaging? What are you actually saying, right? Um, on the access piece, I mean, you basically have to try everything, you know, we cold calling and networking and so on, right? To get to the actual decision makers. Um, as far as the messaging, you have to be extremely clear in terms of what what is the problem you're trying to solve and how do you how do you deliver on it? And you have to position it in a way that is um, a benefit to them, right? Um, at the end of the day, the the, the the standard hospital executive does not actually care that we're building a two-sided marketplace. <laughs> they want to know how are we going to help them get more permanent hires and, and, and improve their hiring operations and make them successful, right? Uh, because frankly, their, their jobs are tied to this. Their bonuses are tied to this. Their performance reviews are tied to this. So really positioning it in a way that um, ensures that they're successful is important. And then really explaining your differentiation. What is so different about Incredible Health compared to the standard tra traditional recruiting agency? or using Indeed, or using LinkedIn, or using the hospital's own job board. Really clarifying that is, 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 is really, is very critical. Um, and, then, and then the last element is like, I mean, honestly, you just have to find your first believers. At, at every single hospital or health system, even today, right? 
there's always one or two leaders that want to try something different, that know that what has what they've already been doing for the last 10, 20 years is no longer working, and they want to try something um, different. And so really identifying who are the early adopters, who are the innovators in each and every health system is critical. So again, that's why it helped that you started in the San Francisco Bay Area. And it did. It did. That's right. Um, just it, there's a talk about um, rural hospitals where travel nurses are the norm. So does Incredible Health see that they'll have a presence in, in more rural areas to help combat that? Trend. Yeah, um, you know, our ambition is definitely to support both urban and rural areas. We're very, we're, we're uh, probably have a much larger presence in the urban areas in the United States compared to rural. Uh, the, the two exceptions are the markets that we've been in the longest, and that's California and Texas. Uh, what we've discovered is once we, um, once we have, uh, have a very strong presence in every urban area in the state, uh, we have built up our processes, our date, our nurse database, our you know, um, our employer database, so on, in the, to at a point where we are in a good position to serve the rural areas. So we do support Fresno, California, Bakersfield, California, Waco, Texas, so on. You know, you know the, the the locations that are outside of the very big cities very successfully. Now we are definitely not there with some of the other states that we're in. Um, for example, we just you know just started in Ohio, we just started in Missouri. Um, we must, we're very focused on just the urban areas there before expanding into the rural areas of those states. I think this one, do you think it is important to have a clinical background, MD, RN, et cetera, first in order to be successful in healthcare, healthcare tech, entrepreneurship? Yeah, I mean, my quick answer to that is no, I don't think it's Import required. I mean, is it helpful? Definitely. <laughs> uh, it, it gives you um, being an MD or an RN in, in healthcare technology does give you more more credibility. Um, mm -hmm. It also helps you empathize with your users more. Um, and uh, especially in the early days, like you have a little bit more jargon and a little bit more knowledge, frankly. Um, however, it is not sufficient. Uh, we um, we very intentionally hire senior leaders and entire teams who do not have clinical backgrounds. Um, I'll give you a few examples. Our entire um, products and engineering team do not come from healthcare. And, and, and our marketing teams as well do not come from healthcare. Uh, and it's very intentional uh, because we want them to come from other industries, whether it's you know transportation or hospitality or wh wherever, right? Um, because they are bringing the best, the best practices from those technology companies that operate in those industries into Incredible Health. Um, and having said that, we have a sales and customer success team, and they definitely have healthcare backgrounds, right? Uh, because that drives more credit. We have that drives more credibility for them with the with the with the employers, with the hospitals. Um, and so it's just important to have like a diversity of backgrounds in when you're building out a company, whether it's building out a leadership team or building the company overall, because uh, there's, there's, there's massive advantages from different backgrounds. Um, and if we're, you're trying to innovate and you're trying to create something from nothing and you're trying to find a new way of doing something, then it helps to have different, a diverse set of voices around the table. Sure, makes sense. So I guess the, the theme through here is you certainly, you don't regret going through medical school and then not practicing. Oh, not at all. I'm not a waste of time. I think it's like the, <laughs> probably one of the best things I did is go to medical school. Yeah. That's good. Now there's a thousand paths to entrepreneurship, right? Right. But that's why I, I, I don't, I usually um, disagree with like fitting into just one specific mold, right? Like there's, um, there's a thousand paths to success. There's a thousand ways to build a company. There is no, silver bullet, right? So, um, and, 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 the, and the proof is that there are many, many teams and many leaders that have been very successful with very different paths and def different approaches. It's the customer obsession, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Success. That it's hard to get away. It's hard to be successful without customer obsession. Right, without that. Um, I think that's all of the questions. Oh, I think. Speaking of differentiation, do you think that the larger companies like Indeed and LinkedIn with larger capital could mimic you and become fast followers to compare to compete against you in the same space? 
Yeah, great, wonderful question. I mean, um, we all have to think about that as, as startup leaders, right? We'll have to think yeah. about what's going on with these big companies. Uh, I'll answer this question in a couple different ways. First and foremost, like you must remain paranoid, right? Like Andy Grove's book, only the paranoid survive. So you do actually have to really be paying attention to what everybody's doing, what other startups are doing, what other what big companies are doing, and so on. Um, because uh, you know that that you just you just got to be aware of all that. Having said that, what I tell myself, and it's as well as what I tell my team, is competition is not going to kill us or make us successful. It's your customers that are going to <laughs> kill you or make you successful. So back to customer obsession, right? Like we need to obsess over users, over the employers, over the talent, nurses, and so on. And not we should not be obsessing over what the competition is doing. And then um, finally is look. There's a lot of business history here around startups, startups versus big companies, you know, David versus Goliath <laughs> um, and amazing books like The Innovator's Dilemma, like uh, by Clayton Christensen, that show that um, it's not a given. It's not guaranteed that these big companies know what they're doing, right? They have a lot of priorities um, that might be very different from a startup's priorities. They have red tape. They move slower. A lot more bureaucracy. A lot yeah. more bureaucracy. So just like... The, the history of business, especially in the US, is innovation, right? It's like the startup take, you know, comes up with something different and it, you know, and it turns into a big company and then the whole cycle starts over again. Like that, that is how uh, we progress in, in business and innovation. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, uh, Iman. Thank you so much, Danielle. We really appreciate uh, the conversation and the perspectives and the insights. Um, thank you all for joining us. And I hope that you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you.